Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Student-Led Journal Club presentation. My name is Anne-Marie Hayes, and I'm a research associate for the Joplin campus of KCU. Today, I will be introducing our speaker, student Dr. Ellis McCormick. Student Dr. Hugh Ellis McCormick is a graduate of Pepperdine University and a current KCU College of Osteopathic Medicine student. At Pepperdine, he received a Bachelor of Arts in History, was involved in the Venice Family Clinic, a nonprofit community health clinic in Venice Beach in Santa Monica, California. After undergraduate education, he worked as a resuscitation science intern in the emergency department of Hanneman University Hospital in Philadelphia until its closure in the summer of 2019. From there, he moved to New York City and took a position at Weill Cornell Medicine with the Englander Institute for Precision Medicine as a, as a biobank coordinator and on the clinical cancer history compilation team. Upon coming to the Midwest, Ellis plugged back into the community health care with Uzazi Village, a Black maternal health organization dedicated to decreasing maternal and infant health inequality in Black and Brown communities. Here, he worked as a research intern in collaboration with Brown School of Public Health at Washington University, St. Louis, and will present on the research done at Uzazi Village. When he has free time, Ellis enjoys avant-garde jazz, reading and cooking from his small collection of cookbooks, global cinema, espresso, sunshine, and spending time with his friends and wife, Kate. Next year, Ellis will be leaving the university to complete a post-sophomore fellowship in pathology at KU Medical Center. Uh, so with that, the floor is yours, student Dr. McCormick. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, I'm thrilled to be here and just to be talking to the Journal Club today. Um, so today I would like to give a presentation on the above topic, um, a presentation on the role of culturally congruent community-based doula services that improve key, air, key birth outcomes in Kansas City. Um, I want to note that historically, uh, from just from my understanding of the research uh, presented at these presentations has been more bench work in nature, but this one is in public health. And I want to acknowledge that, although different, uh, we are both trying to make sense of how to quantify what we see and cannot see to others to understand in a scientific and methodic, uh, methodical method. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So I'm ready to the next slide. I wanna give a brief uh, roadmap just to show where we're going here. We're gonna go from more of a broad topics to a narrow topic and then back broad again. I think this is kind of some ways the way you try to find projects to work on a research, but I wanna make sure that everyone has a good understanding of uh, the background for this paper. And that helps everyone understand what's going to be um, presented later on. So uh, I want to make sure that just those broad topics are understood by everyone and just, you know, overall, not trying to make too many assumptions. So uh, starting there, going to the next slide. Um, I'd like to make a few assumptions here, but specifically speaking to those involved with uh, Kansas City University. Um, I, took a I took a screenshot of our mission, vision, and core values uh, page on Kansas City University. And that final sentence of the, of the mission statement, improving the well-being of communities we serve, and the vision statement, changing healthcare for good. I think those things are big parts of what my role is to be as a physician coming from Kansas City um, University. You know, physician pending, I passed everything, which I think will be great. And um, so moving forward with that is how am, I, how, how am I as a student doctor going to be living these out? And how can I prepare to live this out while a student um, these are things that guide this presentation and guide this work that I'm doing. So moving forward, excuse me, um, I want to start by broadly talking about race and health outcomes. Um, this graph here is from the Kaiser Family Foundation, but and while, excuse me, um, it's it's kind of hard to understand just looking at it. What it does say is that anything highlighted in orange is is, is a quantified a, try, a way to try to quantify how the healthcare outcomes are worse for um, black and brown populations just overall in America in a comparison to our control group, which is white populations. Um, and these are labeled in orange. And the measures counted are things like access to care, housing, education, et cetera. And there may be questions of why, why does this happen? What causes this? I think this varies situation to situation, but there are some broad things that we can look at. I don't have time to dive deeper into this, but I trust you to understand that Black people carry a significantly um, harder statistically burden of health. 
I'd love to move on to this next slide to talk more about social determinants of health and for us to think about how this plays into our lives and how you think this may play out. So I think these are great baseline questions we can ask about a population and what they have access to as far as social determinants of health. I'm sorry that my um, my source got popped on top of the um, image there, but a lot of these have to do with factors outside of someone's personal choices, but really go into a more civil le leadership um, role. And so in the past chart, when these were lower than average, they appeared in orange. So I'll just give everyone a second to kind of read through some of those maybe things someone has access to, maybe things that you have had access to. And if you wanna learn more about these, Dr. Rex, Ar Rex Archer and Dr. Benjamin Grin give great lectures to the Kansas City and Joplin comm students on these topics and have both been pivotal members of the Kansas City Depart Department of Public Health. So going from there, I'd like to move into maternal health. So taking what we've seen in the past slides, I wanna step into this world. This chart above shows where we are at in America today from 2018 to 2020. This is a graph from the CDC broadly showing how maternal mortality is steadily increasing even over the past few years. This is uh, defined as death that occurs within a year mark of birth that is tied to causes surrounding the birth. So this isn't something that's you know accidental death or um, things like that. This is something directly related to the maternal uh, and birthing process. So making a few assumptions, I would like to voice that pregnant populations are pretty vulnerable and a good litmus test for how we as a society are functioning. As part of a healthcare institution, being aware of this is helpful in judging how well our system is functioning as a whole. This is a good visual aid to see that, um, hmm, something isn't going well with maternal health right now, even regardless of race, but it specifically shows that black populations are faring even worse. I'd like to talk about how this was titled a maternal health crisis, but I really would like to change that word to a maternal health demise. A crisis makes it sound somewhat hysterical, like a fire with a line of firefighters with hoses and buckets, everyone rushing in to help, lots of emergency services, things like that. But I think of a demise as a small, is the, is the small slow falling of a cliff into the sea over time. And that's how I feel that this is. This wasn't something that happened overnight. This wasn't a fire that ignited all of a sudden. These are things that took time to happen and where the reasons we got to this point, we're still trying to figure out. Um, so I wanna go back to this graph where we can see that non-Hispanic black populations carry the biggest burden of this graph as far as statistics go. So here we come to a summary point where we say, okay, black health comes, outcomes are bad and these continue to be bad in pregnant populations and it looks like it's getting worse. So what do we do? This is scary and death around Childbirth on the rise? I thought we were a developed nation. I thought this ended in the 20th century. This was something we read about in fiction books about the past. But I want to transition from here and move on to infant mortality. So this is another CDC chart that indicates just how broadly the infant mortality for Black infants is twice that of white, of white people in America. Wow. So not only are women more at risk of dying in childbirth, but also their infants are too, even if they are healthy. But why is this? What are the big reasons why? Well, let's head to our next slide. If we look at the number one cause of infant mortality, it's low birth weight. There are other things that happen to infants, and some of these are complex medical issues that we don't have as many treatments or control for. But if we look at congenital malformations, they're still present in non-Hispanic white and white populations. But look at the low birth rate death rate, look at the birth rate deaths tied to low birth weight and between um, non-Hispanic at the top, at the top here, top left, and then moving over four. You can see that while there's still a burden from congenital malformations, low birth weight significantly affects non-Hispanic black populations. You know, and so that ends up having it be four times as likely to die from low birth weight if you're a black infant versus a white infant. How interesting. But I want to, but I want to go along with this and say, well, student Dr. McCormick, this is national stuff. This is from the CDC. We can't do much there. That's for Washington DC and politicians to figure out. And it's too big of a problem for us. Well, I'd like to head to Kansas City. Since I got to KCU, it's important to look at solutions as a way to improving the well-being of communities we serve. For me, this doesn't look like going off to a different city in America or to a different country. And while those people and different organizations feel their mission and see out this mission differently, I think it's really important to look at our backyard and to look at those who sit me, around us and within our communities. 
17.9% of black infants are born premature in Kansas City. And this comes from the Kansas City Department of Public Health, who I want to give a great shout out to because they were awesome in providing us with data through 2020, which correlates um, with our data that we will that I will share later. This statistic trends three percentage points lower than the US, which sits at a 14.2% of black infants being born premature and a 2% higher, um, higher chance than Missouri as a whole at 15.2%. It's an embarrassing statistic, and it's somewhere between one in six and one in five Black infants born in Kansas City will be premature. So thinking back on those last few graphs, you can start doing the calculations of how many infants are being born premature and what those health outcomes are looking like. And this isn't the shame in Black women. White women are only at 11.3% infants being born premature and are doing far better than the national average. So looking at the nation, it's actually better. Looking in our backyard is much more scary. 15.3% of Black infants are born with a low birth weight, and these are correlated. Premature births are tied to low birth weight. That's a more complex physiological discussion and embryology that I won't really get into, but there isn't a correlation of low birth weight going back to um, early, early delivery. There is sometimes, but overall, the longer the gestational age, the higher the birth weight of the infant, and the higher the birth weight, the better the healthcare outcomes for the infant. So if we think about the above, Kansas City is not immune and it's actually trending a percentage point lower than the U.S. as a whole again at 14%. So let's let these stats be a baseline for the coming population. And I wanna think about this. So now that we have you know one to five and one of six infants coming out preterm, where do they go? We go to the NICU and look how long these days can get in the NICU starting at 24 weeks going up to 37 weeks, which is defined as the cutoff point for premature for a premature birth. So not only staying is the NICU just to grow, the earlier the pregnancy is born, the more likely they are to have health problems. Babies born before 34 weeks of pregnancy are mostly likely to have health problems, but babies born between 34 and 37 weeks of pregnancy are also at an increased risk of having health problems related to premature birth. Premature babies stay in the NICU until their organs develop enough to stay alive without medical support. Some babies need NICU care for weeks or months until they can breathe on their own, eat by mouth, and maintain their body temperature and body weight. And a lot of this information comes from the March of Dimes, which I think is a great resource if you want to look in more into infant mortality in America and your state. So now, what else do we know about the NICU? Any buzzwords come to mind? For me, it's expensive. It's expensive, and when it's Medicaid-funded NICU stays, that's taxpayer dollars or private insurance doctor dollars. The average NICU cost is about three thousand dollars per day, and we'll come back to this number later in the in in the in in this presentation. So if you do the math, it adds up quick. If there were ninety four thousand Black infants born in the KC across a handful of zip codes from twenty thirteen to twenty twenty, at a seventeen percent prematurity rate, you can begin to see where we're headed and the cost that this puts on the healthcare system. So let's go to the next slide. So what do we do? We know that Black pregnant populations are really at risk based upon the above factors, and because of their position, that leads to tragic birth outcomes, and in the best case, in a bad scenario, can lead to increased costs on the back end. So how can aid be provided? Well, a good place to start is to go help. But how do we do that? Well, where are the people? Let's look at a heat map of racial diversity in Kansas City. I want to apologize for the fidelity of this map. A higher resolution, better map was unable to be found. And for those of you who are in Joplin, welcome to Kansas City. Green dots are, white, are black households and blue dots are white households. Red is Asian and yellow is Hispanic. And this isn't including much of Wyandotte County, which has a large Hispanic population. Where are our black populations living? Where can we analyze social determinants of health that may be affecting these outcomes? This map is a good place to start. While it's 2010 data, and I would like to note that this is 2010 and a lot of black populations are being moved across Highway 71 East due to increasing rents. And if you want to look more into that, I really recommend driving down Troost and seeing all the development happening there. But why this occurs and why it looks like this is multifactorial and policy-based. But I really recommend looking into redlining in Kansas City and taking the guiding lines tour via the App Store. I do not have time to explain the deeper aspects of this today, but you have to trust me on this one. And if it, does anyone here you can chat out, know what the line is that separates the green and blue. I'll give a few seconds. So this is um, not the state line, this is actually Troost Avenue. It's just a street. So 
when we look at this, we say, wow, so seeing this, we should set up some sort of community clinic to help with this. We know exactly where the most vulnerable are statistically in our community. Let's start the studies. Let's dive deep and find the answers. Let's make a difference. Well, this is where I come in. Let's go to the next slide. As noted in my bio, I have a background in community health work. It's something that grounds me during these times of intense academia, and additionally, is the small part that I can give towards healing broken parts in my community. This is the Venice Family Clinic above. It looks just like your average healthcare building, where I worked in undergrad in Venice Beach, California. It's a huge hub for unhoused and migrant populations in West Los Angeles. This is my first foray specifically into community health, and I worked there in primary care for multiple years. Community health is something that as a role as a physician in my community, I have a responsibility to do, no matter the specialty. Orthopedists advocate for seatbelts. Neurologists advocate for helmets. GI physicians for vegetables and primary care physicians for better health in their communities. And secondly, when I was an undergrad, I was first exposed to the idea of maternal health crisis. I've been slowly seeing these maternal health statistics rise and get worse since I first learned about it then. So I wanted to get involved with that too. So how do I get involved in Kansas City? Where do I go? I headed to Google. All of these things I talked about before regarding black maternal health and infant mortality that we're seeing that we're seeing presented statistically and from large government organizations, black members of the Kansas City community have been doing this work for at least a decade. They saw it long before traditional systems could. Remember, it's a demise and not a crisis. We may be seeing a crisis, but it's always been a demise. Usazi Village is an organization founded in 2011 by Hakima Payne and three others, dedicated to decreasing maternal and infant health inequality among Black and Brown communities. They do this mainly as a doula education center, but also as a small clinic and doula service provider. It was pretty much a perfect fit for me. I can work in two realms, both community health and actively work against the demise of mortality crisis, and it also gets to be an academic pursuit for me. Excuse me. I am the VP of the ob Club and love the content that we cover in the endo Repro material. I built this so it was not only a service opportunity, but also a way for me to be hands and feet, boots on the ground, seeing how things are going in my city, much like the VFC. So going to the next slide, I'd like to show you this dot. This red dot is where Usazi Village is located, perfectly situated on this heat map of where the line between white and black populations in Kansas City live. Because of its location, this is a heat map of the main clientele coming for Zazi Village. Remember, what's that line right there? It's not the state line, it's truce. So you have a great center, but who staffs it? What does that look like? Don't you need providers? Well, there are administrators and leadership like Mama Hakima, but the doulas are the critical members of this patient care team. You may ask, what is a doula? Isn't that another name for a midwife? Isn't a midwife a nurse? Wait, where's the doctor in all of this? Defined, a doula is a trained professional who provides continuous physical, emotional, and informational support to their client before, during, and shortly after childbirth to help them achieve the healthiest, most satisfying experience possible. Midwives provide medical care for you during for a, for a patient during pregnancy, birth, and the immediate postpartum period. Doulas provide the patient and their families with emotional, informational, and physical support during pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. I'm not really going to touch on the physician role in this too much. But know that they are there and know that their availability is limited in scope and can be limited in access due to many factors. Also think of physicians as the status quo and sole providers. All of those statistics that you hear that are negative, think physicians, nurses, and hospital systems. Those are coming out of this status quo system that we have today. Doulas do not erase physicians. They're important care partners and care extenders. But you know what would even be more helpful? Sending a bunch of outsiders to tell people what to do. That always works. But what if the doulas are from the same community and background as the clientele? That's where another factor of Usazi comes into play. While there are other doula organizations in Kansas City, Usazi is focused on Black populations. It is by the people for the people. And this is what we call cultural congruency. Culturally congruent practices are providing care to a patient while being aware and inclusive of their cultural values, beliefs, and practices. Any healthcare provider needs to be culturally competent so that they can provide for their patients with respect to their cultural practices. This provides a better fit between the doula and the client. There is mutual trust here through mutual shared backgrounds and demographics. Let's go ahead and move on. But student Dr. McCormick, you aren't a doula and you aren't a doctor. You're just a med student. What do you do for them? What do you, how do you play into this? Well, that was a question we had too, but we got creative and a great opportunity came up to work as a research intern for them and work on a 10-year analysis of their EHR data for their initial years. And I'd like to disclose that 
I'm a volunteer for Usazi and I am not a staff member. I only report to them and I do not intend today to speak on their behalf or claim their successes as mine. They do incredible work and the honor goes to them. I just get the privilege of writing it down and helping them present and share it to policymakers, civil leaders, and academics. So a team of researchers from the Brown School of Public Health at WashU and I were tasked to look at how culturally congruent, community-based dual services affect health of pregnant patients in Black neighborhoods in Kansas City, or better put, the role of culturally congruent, community-based dual services in improving key birth outcomes in Kansas City. This is the policy brief I helped offer. You can find the link in the Canvas invite or just send me an email afterwards. It's also available on Google Scholar. Usazi was founded in 2011, and they used two EHR systems from that time until now. Rhea Hedge, author one on this paper, paper, painstakingly compiled the data from these two EHR, EHRs. Our final N of the complete patients was 321. This may seem small, but remember, we are looking at a grassroots care organization that doesn't have the resources, resources and scope of a large medical center or a public health department. There were three key outcomes we wanted to look at as a neutral party to analyze how successful or unsuccessful the doula partnership was for patients. These three things were gestational age, birth weight, and APGAR score. Two of these we talked about earlier. I won't talk too much on the APGAR score, but it's an immediate score given at one minute and five minutes after an infant is born that can tell how, how uh, as a sign of life and how well the infant is doing postpartum. While not only being predictors noted to be related to negative health outcomes, these were also values we could find a control group for with the KC Department of Public Health that you saw before. They were extremely helpful and transparent in giving us data from 2013 to 2020. I can show a bit more of this data after the presentation if you would like, or you can see some more on the paper. This goal of this paper was not only to explain what I've gone through the previous slides to the community, but also provide policy workers and civil leaders answers and possible solutions to the problems listed in the previous slides. Let's take a look at this data. Let's move to the next slide. So after our work, here's the comparative data. It's pretty simple, but it's not trivial. Excuse me. There were other demographic findings, but we wanted to hone in on these three factors. This is from the top nine zip codes compiled from the USAZI EHR data compared to the KC Department of Public Health data as a control. That was the limitation we were posed with. So let's look at the increase in infants making it to term. Wow, that's pretty amazing to me. From a bland standpoint, think about how much money was saved. Think back to the NICU chart and the cost of 3,000 per day, but that is to the healthcare system, which an average NICU stay is $30,000 to an insurance payer. Imagine if you were to reverse engineer all these charts with these rates going into them, what would our demographics look like? What would our society look like? How would it look going backwards in this deck? These babies grow bigger. They reach term more often. They spend less time in the NICU. Breastfeeding is implemented sooner and they grow stronger, healthier, and families deal with less chronic health conditions and are more robust in at least one metric. Parents and child are together. Think about the exponential yield for generations. And really looking at this slide, this is the really the key hinge point of the paper. As you see, there's a 40% relative difference in a decrease of preterm births coming from Usazi Village versus the Kansas City control. Again, we're also percentage point better in low birth weight with a relative difference of 8.5%. And compared to Missouri and the U.S. as a whole, it's looking pretty good. It's an impressive indication that the Usazi Village system is working and that culturally congruent duty-based care can have excellent healthcare outcomes as a public health initiative. So shout out from the rooftops if this works. Why haven't I heard about it? Well, it's in the KC Star, but remember, it's still not totally talked about and understood. And that's part of my role. Remember how I called it a demise, not a crisis? It's still very quiet work. But as is most of healthcare, there's only so much you can share. So moving forward, where do we go from here? This is a policy brief to look at the efficacy and effectiveness of this model and see if there are policies that could change to benefit this model in at-risk populations. It's also an informative pamphlet. The terms used are not too complex and wanted to be written in language that did not take a technical education to understand. It has been presented to the community at Usazi and to some local civic, civic leaders who were there. It indicates that doula care can make a huge impact in at-risk populations, not only from a personal and health outcome standpoint, but can on a financial standpoint as well. Missouri Medicaid does not currently provide coverage for doula services. However, the state's budget does include funds for community-based doula training, and the state has begun distri dis distributing $500,000 a year to doula organizations. Additionally, at least two Medicaid managed care organizations 
have implemented or are developing plans to reimburse doula services in a few target areas of the state. But why would they do this? Remember how NICU stays could cost an insurance company $30,000? What if they front loaded that? Paying a doula $15,000 could save them a lot of money, but that's the thing. A doula currently costs about $1,500 to care for a person throughout their pregnancy and into postpartum. And that's a crazy statistic to think about. I would hire all of them. This could change everything. Let's put a bill through. This could be huge. Think about the physicians that could worry about postpartum care less. Think about the families with an ally. Let's do it. Well, that's really for the next journey. Based on our analysis, we really think Missouri policymakers should consider including doula services as covered as a Medicaid benefit. Doula services have proven to be a cost-effective method to increase positive health outcomes for mothers and babies and to aid in closing the gap in racial disparities that exist within the healthcare system. This brief provides new evidence that these services can help improve key birth outcomes in a measurable way at an organization that is already deeply engaged in this work. We found that outcomes improve for women and families who seek out doula care relative to the comparison group. I personally think that you don't even have to care about this emotionally, ethically, morally, spiritually, or compassionately. You can also be proven to it that it's just good sense financially. And that's fun when both of those align. Sorry, I'm scrolling down here. So where do we go from here? I'm not sure. It's not in, I'm not in leadership at Uzazi or in the Missouri state level. They saw it before my time there and they will carry it on after. They're extremely resilient and dedicated and open-hearted at Uzazi and hardworking individuals that I'm humbled to say I get to work with. I am also heading into pathology fellowship next year and may have to put my efforts elsewhere. But I can say that the trend is positive and it's papers like this that give advocates statistics and data to use and continue to champion those that are most marginalized in our community. You may ask, what can I do? How can I get involved? Are there suggestions for further research? I encourage first introspection of your heart and spirit to see where you align with this data. I would then look at your interpersonal life and analyze where you see these trends in your own relationships and how this narrative fits in there. For KC locals, I would strongly suggest walking down Troost Avenue, maybe to Azazi, and then taking the bus back up to your car and then driving over to the Whole Foods and walking the trolley trail just a few miles away and seeing the differences in quality of life and outcomes of infrastructure that we have there. I'll leave you the quote from my cell biology professor at Pepperdine, Dr. Donna Nosviger. Not everyone fills the bucket, but everyone just adds their drop. I want to thank you for your time, and I'm now happy to answer questions that as best as I can. Awesome. Thank you so much, student Dr. McCormick. Great presentation. Um, as you just said, if anybody has any questions, comments, feel free to raise your hand in Zoom and I will call on you. Or if you can't talk, uh, you can put them in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Um, any questions? Um, so my name is student Dr. Hira. Nice to meet you and thank you for your presentation. Um, I did a lot of work in my master's actually about um, the effects of trauma on pregnant and parenting women. So this is something that really resonates with me. And something we talked about a lot in my research group is our own positionality as well and how that influences things. So I'm just curious how you feel your own kind of position in terms of sociodemographics um, and your own background, all those kind of things. Um, has it influenced this work? And then how just on an individual level, I know you touched on it a few times in terms of how healthcare and doctors specifically have a role in this work, but how do you as an individual feel like this work is going to influence your own career um, and your perspective on that? Yeah, I think touching on the interpersonal thing, you know, being able to go to med school and have an education is the men's privilege. Coming from a background of mine, you know, specifically seeing once you do this health, you know, once you do public health work and any sort of policy or, you know, even majoring in history, you see that as a white male, you're awarded certain privileges in your society just by just by aspects of your race. And I think if you're given privilege or have privilege, you do have a duty to your community to do better for that. That comes both from my religious and personal beliefs, as well as just general ideas I have about society. As far as my career goes, um, you know, I do see myself playing out community health. But like I said, no matter the specialty that someone's in, there's ways you advocate for your community. And even if it's for basic sciences or you need to have a look at a policy paper, you do have the information and the intelligence to look at that and make a difference and have a, have a voice in policy discussion. So I think that rests no matter what. How someone does that in pathology, I'm still trying to figure that out. But I think that those are ways that I can see myself working in that um, aspect. A big thing for me I think about is uh, nutrition and food so how we grow food how we make food how we distribute it you know i go on runs or walks and i go look through the trash cans and recycling bins on running day to see what people are eating 
you know, if you want to know what your public health is, go to Sam's and look in the shopping carts. That's the things I recommend to people. You know, you can look at data, but if you walk around and use your eyes, ears, and senses, you can learn a lot about that. And so that's something that really got me to this point of, I go on walks, I go on a bike, I ride my bike, I see the city. It's, you know, some people call it, um, in skateboarding, when people are looking for spots, they call it block work. And, you know, I'm going right today or I'm going left today. That's how I see and feel things. And so when I see and feel those things, I look to get involved. And that was kind of what I wanted to do with the explanation of how I got involved at New South Wales and things like that. So if that answers the question, well, feel free to ask um, extra questions on that too. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask actually how you, uh, you talked about this grounds you a lot throughout med school and I can definitely like, understand mm -hmm. why like seeing the bigger picture is definitely helpful when you're you know going through courses overwhelmed stuff like that but uh what was the I guess initial spark for you in your want to help the community and those around you um it comes out of it comes out of my uh spiritual beliefs as a, as a Protestant Christian uh initially that's where it comes from you know I'm called to serve those most marginalized like Christ but additionally, um, it comes into, I think as a whole society, this is the, the data points that it's that there are broken parts of any community. And I think we're called as, as healthcare providers and as a, and again, as students and staff at KCU with a mission statement like ours to work in our community uh, like that way. So I think that's really where it starts. It stems out of it stems out of my faith and how that kind of aligns my compass. But moving forward, um, it's also grounding to work in quote unquote, real healthcare in a time of where your health, you know, where your learning can be so abstract and you're putting a lot in and out all day in and day out. This is a great grounding exercise and score one's great. I really like score one. I came to KCU because I thought school would be really cool. Um, I wish it was scheduled at different times, but uh, it's all, overall a great opportunity for students to really see their community. And you see some of that idea of like, why are people why are, why are, why are kids have abscesses in their mouth? Why do they have diabetes so young? Why do they have, you know, X, Y, Z factors? You know, what are we looking at that? I think case and students get a little taste of that there. So, and some people are called to that action, but it's hard to find a meaningful, a meaningful way to move into that and lean into that. And so that takes creative work. And so in a roundabout way, that's kind of how that was where the spark gets for me to do community service. I'm also a Boy Scout. And so well, I was, uh, so that, that was a, that was a part of it. It was a big time. There's a big, uh, there's a big uh, tie of volunteerism there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, looks like Dr. Wolf, you have a question? Yeah, thanks. I enjoyed your talk a lot. Um, I was curious if you had any data on rural versus urban. I'm a small town mm. boy, and I was curious, you know, look like looking at yeah. your statistics there, uh, how much the 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 blacks in rural America, for example, contributed to those statistics versus versus urban was what was one thing I, thought. I don't I don't but I don't deny that there may be differences and I don't deny that there are a myriad of different health problems happening in rural America which is its own frightening um thing to look at I think one of the things is looking at the overall statistics of Missouri versus Kansas City with Missouri being a pretty rural state and those being decreased, it statistically is better. But again, isolated examples may be worse, just like in Kansas City. So the focus for me in this project was with urban populations, but I don't doubt that rural populations have their own struggles with access to care. Sometimes, and one way I always talk about it with, the, someone was asking me, who's a music anthropologist, a friend of mine said, you know, how do you talk, what's the difference between blues and, and country music? I said, well, blues is you're seeing all the good things, and they're not yours or they're take or not you're not allowed to be a part of them and country music sadness it's just there's nothing there for us at all and i think that's how i kind of describe some of the haves and have nots of different geographic um of geographic populations um but i'm also from as rural as it gets to suburban texas and so that's um that is i can't speak to a real rural environment uh, but I do recognize it different. And that's that's way it's some of the future things we can look at, you know. Um, but the biggest thing I know with rural healthcare is uh traveling to access to care, which is a big thing for many people. Um, but that ends up being a factor. Uh so Zoom and things like that continue to be a growing field of interest for uh healthcare providers as a whole. Yeah, the other thing, especially over the past few years, has just been rural politics versus city politics in many respects, I think, probably has influenced some of these things as well. 
the other thing that was interesting to me, uh, you didn't provide an answer to why you were succeeding. You know, why, why is mm. that, why is that happening? And I, you know, I, you may have used sketchy farm or something other than my notes for farm in the endo repo course, but um, I mentioned in my lecture, uh, urea plasma as, as kind of an emerging STD, for example. And I, I was sitting here in the background trying to see if there was a difference in urea plasma between races, for example, because it seems to me that so many people are infected with it. It's not really uh, looked at and uh, evidence continues to emerge that that's an important contributor of preterm births. So that, that was, you know, just kind of a side segue, but I, I was still really curious the why. I mean, you know, what you were saying. Yeah, was, I, that's, well, a, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. The, the paper talks a little bit about that more in discussion. And I, I, do, I do know that I, you, you are right and in this, I really didn't um, talk as to the why and some of the ways the why isn't, um, isn't yet able to be, this is a discussion we're having because we aren't able to say what the why is. There's so many things that are not captured or quantified in the EHRs with the relational aspect of how doulas are as a guide, as an advocate, as a, uh, a touch point for people throughout the pre, anti and postpartum experience. And so that's kind of what I was talking about. Of we're really trying to make sense of how uh, we can grab some of these spiritual things because they're not necessarily dosing medications, and they're not necessarily um, they're not necessarily you know performing procedures. Although they do guide and labor and things like that, but there is we we do note there's a correlation when it occurs. And so one of the projects that I have moving forward with Uzazi is hey let's look through our EHR. Let's find ways to talk about these touch points. Let's find new questions to ask to figure out how can we quantify exactly what doulas are doing. Because who else want you know who else wants to know the answer to your question is insurance companies. They want to know hey how do we know exactly what the doulas are doing or how can we perform the bare minimum to get that or hey can we give them a stipend if the baby doesn't go to the NICU you know can you get a bonus can we do that those are questions that I've seen on calls. Uh, having things like that. So those are good questions to ask and things moving forward. And, you know, I wish I could give an exact answer, but it's more of the idea of we see all these things happening when this is culturally congruent and there are doulas happening within the organization in marginalized populations, this proves to be a better outcome. So I wish I had a better answer for that, but I really don't. Um, well, that is I, I'm trying to trust yeah. the statistics are speaking on that one. Yeah, I, I was just gonna gonna add. I mean, your your comment about there being the the cultural congruence or whatever. I mean, in education research or various other things, I, I think everything has shown that you can't be an outsider and come in and show people uh, who are living their daily lives how they how to how to do things. It has to be the community leaders, somebody somebody that has somehow uh, accumulated the respect of 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 people, you know, the person they go to for help. And that it seems to me is what, the, what those doulas are doing here. The, the, final question that I, the final question that I had was, to what extent have you reached out? So I have a trucker friend, for example, who was sitting there and complaining that truckers were not getting any attention. And I said, well, hell, it's from Wisconsin. I said, reach out to Tammy Baldwin, see if she'll talk to you. And she did. And uh, she arranged for him to talk to Pete Buttigieg. And so I'm curious to what extent you're mm -hmm. reaching out to Emmanuel Cleaver, for example, and saying, hey, are you aware of what's going on in your city right here? And are you taking this message to, um, <clears throat> to your colleagues in the house? Well, that's a really good, that's a really interesting question. And this is something that I work with at Usazi is really my role there was not be a white voice speaking for black people, but to equip black voices with more uh, policy and papers there. So Hakima Payne, who runs the Village, does speak a lot on their behalf. So personally, I can call and say things as a student doctor. But the goal for me with this part, with this in this presentation was not to take over and say, I'm the one speaking for this organization mm. because I'm white and I have to. My goal is within my community, but I want to support them and help them in that journey. And so calling a representative, you know, I personally haven't done that, but I have been in the, in the meeting rooms where Hakima is presenting to to local civic leaders about this data. And I think my role in that uh, is providing, you know, talk about this with this policy brief is to provide people in power um, more specific and more information for that. So in a way, this is this is my my phone call is uh, just written down. But 
uh, if that that's how I would say it. So no, like you know, as far as civil um, civil phone calls, I haven't done that. I put my time and um, efforts into hours and um, writing. That's just in my personal life, uh, not for or against it. That's just kind of where I've ended up. No, I mean that 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 absolutely makes sense. But you know, like you were talking for Medicaid, for example, I'm assuming that a lot of the Medicaid rules and regulations are at the federal level, and and so to the extent that that you can and and they're always interested in saving money. And I'm going well to the extent that you can can make people aware of these things, it would be kind of cool. But that, but I agree completely that you're probably yeah. not the person to uh, yeah. spread the message. It's not really mine to share. I, you know, within a medical academic community, you know, this is my first time presenting this data and this data has been presented a lot of times by staff at the SASI, but this is really my population to speak to in this. And so that's why I'm really at the, in this journal club. Um, and so, uh, but moving forward with that, um, with the Medicaid, that's a whole other conversation. The Medicaid is really difficult um, just to work with in general and trying to understand a big route. I don't understand it. It's one, it's not a part of my curriculum. And I understand why, because I think pharmacology is hard. Medicaid's even harder. Um, but, uh, you know, going from there, uh, there's a lot to understand and unpack. And the people I work with, um, especially Dr. Abigail Barker, who's another author on this paper, they, um, they work a lot in Medicaid activism as, on the state level. And there's a lot of decisions that can actually be made in the state system and working with insurance payers who the state contracts to, because they're, look, they're looking to get, you know, find ways for cost savings because, you know, they're paid by the government to provide insurance, insurance provider as a state Medicaid provider. But they say, well, the government's paying us this and we have to pay out this. What if we could pay out less? Because that means we get to save more money for our company. So that's why there's a great financial incentive to it too, which is another way to prove it. So if you don't think about it, you know, one of the things I love to say was like, you know, if you don't care about it on any sort of ethics or moral standing of why we should care for the community, it's actually financially a great opportunity. So if money is the only thing that motivates you, I can still make this prove this is a great thing. So um, yeah, any other questions? Happy to, happy to keep talking. Um, if there are no other questions or if you're typing it in the chat furiously, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much again, student Dr. McCormick. Great presentation. You were super articulate and um, great work. Yeah, thank you for speaking with us today. No problem. Um, thank you all again for having me and for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on my email. Uh, it's hugh.mccormick at cancer.edu. He was my first name. I think it's in the uh, slide or in the presentation, but you can reach out to me if you have any other questions or things like that. I'm happy to talk.